welcome to the module on musculoskeletal injuries. By the end of this module, you will be able to define the skeletal system and its parts, define the structure of human bones and joints, define open fracture and closed fracture, describe the signs and symptoms of open fractures and closed fractures, define dislocation, sprain and strain, explain the signs and symptoms of dislocations, sprains and strains, demonstrate the pre-hospital treatment of fractures and dislocations and explain the role of volunteers. Let us begin by understanding what musculoskeletal injuries are. Musculoskeletal injuries are injuries of muscular or skeletal systems, including damage to skeletal muscles, bones, tendons, ligaments, joints, cartilages and other soft tissues. Musculoskeletal injuries can arise from a sudden exertion, for example lifting a heavy object or from repeated motions exerting repetitive strain or from repeated exposure to force, vibration or awkward posture. Injuries and pain in the musculoskeletal system caused by acute traumatic events like road accident or a fall are also considered a part of musculoskeletal injuries. Musculoskeletal injuries can affect many different parts of the body including upper and lower back, neck, shoulders and extremities like arms, legs, feet and hands. The human musculoskeletal system, also known as the locomotor system and previously the activity system, is an organ system that gives humans the ability to move using their muscular and skeletal systems. The musculoskeletal system provides form, support, stability and movement to the body. It is made up of bones, muscles, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, joints and other connective tissue that supports and binds tissues and organs together. The musculoskeletal system's primary functions include supporting the body, allowing motion and protecting vital organs. The skeletal portion of the system serves as the main storage system for calcium and phosphorus and contains critical components of the production of red blood cells. This system describes how bones are connected to other bones and muscle fibers via connective tissue such as tendons and ligaments. The bones provide stability to the body. The skeleton of an adult human consists of 206 bones. It is composed of 300 bones at birth, which decreases to 206 bones by adulthood after some bones have fused together. It consists of 80 bones in the axial skeleton, 28 in the skull and 52 in the torso and 126 bones in the appendicular skeleton, 32 times 2 in the upper extremities including both arms and 31 times 2 in lower extremities including both legs. Ossification of bone is the process of bone formation. This process begins between the 6th and 7th week of embryonic development and continue until age of 25 years. Click on each skeleton to know more about them. The axial skeleton consists of 80 bones, including skull, thorax and vertebral or spinal column. The appendicular skeleton consists of 126 bones which include shoulder, clavicle and scapula, upper extremities, arms, hands, fingers, pelvis or hips and lower extremities, legs, feet and toes. Now that you have a better understanding of human bone structure and joints, let me walk you through the functions of the skeletal system. The skeletal system provides support for the body, stores minerals and lipids, produces blood cells, protects body organs and provides leverage and movement. Now that you have a better understanding of the functions of the skeletal system, let me walk you through the symptoms of musculoskeletal injury.
Musculoskeletal injuries result from the damage to muscular or skeletal systems, which usually occur due to a strenuous and or repetitive activity. They are among the most common work-related injuries. These also occur due to trauma. The symptoms of a musculoskeletal injury include pain in the hands, arms, shoulders, neck, back, legs, or feet. May include swelling, numbness, tingling, and a feeling of heaviness and or tiredness in the affected area. Some may experience multiple symptoms due to more than one injury. Musculoskeletal injuries involve damage of muscles, bones, tendons, blood vessels, nerves, and other soft tissues. Treatments vary and can produce different results. Musculoskeletal pain affects the muscles, ligaments, tendons, and bones. Flip each card to know more. Bone fractures breaks in bones due to trauma or repetitive stress. Muscle strains and tears, damage to muscles caused by overexertion or sudden movements. Tendinitis, inflammation of tendons caused by repetitive movements. Carpal tunnel syndrome, compression of the median nerve in the wrist, often from repetitive hand movements. Herniated discs, injury to the intervertebral discs in the spine due to repetitive stress or trauma. Sprains and ligament injuries, stretching or tearing of ligaments caused by sudden movements or trauma. Nerve entrapment, compression or pinching of nerves, leading to pain and dysfunction. Soft tissue injuries, damage to blood vessels, nerves and other soft tissues due to trauma or repetitive strain. Let us now test what you have learnt till now. Answer the question to proceed. Have you heard about fractures? Let me walk you through the term fracture, its symptoms and types of fractures. A fracture is a break in a bone. Fractures commonly occur because of road accidents, falls or sports injuries. Other causes are low bone density and osteoporosis, which cause weakening of the bones. Overuse can cause stress fractures, which are very small cracks in the bone. Click on the respective pictures to know more about the types and symptoms of fractures. Fractures can be categorized as open or closed, closed fracture being one in which the overlying skin remains intact. Proper splinting can help reduce the damage associated with a closed fracture. In open fracture, if the broken bone punctures the skin, it is called an open or compound fracture. The bone may or may not protrude through the wound. Open fractures are serious because of the risk of contamination. In comminuted fracture, the bone is broken in at least two or more pieces. Symptoms of a fracture are intense pain, deformity, the limb looks out of place, swelling, bruising, or tenderness around the injury, numbness and tingling, and difficulty in moving a limb. Do you know about dislocation, sprain, strain and muscle cramp? Let me walk you through the terms dislocation, sprain, strain and muscle cramp. Drag and drop the triangle at each image to know more. A dislocation is a separation of two bones from the joint, that is to say, a dislocated joint is a joint where the bones are no longer in their normal positions.
A sprain is a stretched or torn ligament. Ligaments are tissues that connect bones at a joint. Falling, twisting or getting hit can cause a sprain. Ankle and wrist sprains are common. Symptoms include pain, swelling, bruising and being unable to move your joints. You might feel a pop or tear when the injury occurs. A strain is a stretched or torn muscle or tendon. Tendons are tissues that connect muscle to bone. Twisting or pulling these tissues can cause a strain. Strains can happen suddenly or develop over time. Strain mainly affects muscles of back and hamstring while playing sports. Muscle cramp is a sudden unexpected tightening of one or more muscles. Exercising or working hard especially in heat can lead to muscle cramps. Now that we have a better understanding of what is dislocation, sprain and strain, let me walk you through their symptoms. Drag the symptoms into the drop box to know more about them. Symptoms of dislocation are numbness or tingling at the joint or beyond it, very painful, especially if you try to use the joint or put weight on it, limited movement, swollen or bruised, and visibly out of place, discolored, or not in shape. Ankle and wrist sprains are common. Symptoms include pain, swelling, bruising and being unable to move your joints. You might feel a pop or tear when the injury occurs. Symptoms of strain may include experiencing pain or tenderness, Observing redness or bruising in the affected area, experiencing limited range of motion, muscle spasms, swelling, and a sensation of muscle weakness. Symptoms of muscle cramp may include experiencing pain or tenderness, observing redness of skin in the affected area, experiencing muscle weakness, and severe discomfort. Treatment, muscle cramp can be treated with stretching of muscle gently and drinking plenty of liquids. Now that we have a better understanding of the signs and symptoms of dislocation, sprain and strain, let me walk you through the pre-hospital treatment of fractures and dislocations. Examination involves use of your senses and skills of inspection or looking, auscultation or listening and palpation or feeling. Use universal precautions and secure the scene. The pre-hospital treatment of fractures and dislocations includes the following steps. Perform initial assessment, identify and treat life-threatening problem, do not be distracted by dramatic looking injuries, Remember to use cervical collar and provide oxygen. If necessary, perform a physical exam using BPDOC. Check for visible bleeding. Assess for severe pain. Look for visible deformities in joints and bones. Inspect for open injuries. Listen for crepitus sound. Stabilize the injury. Secure injury site by providing manual stabilization, maintain stabilization until proper immobilization, expose the injury, cut away clothing and remove jewelry before swelling occurs, treat open wounds and control bleeding, cover wounds with a clean or sterile dressing, avoid applying direct pressure over broken bone ends, use pressure points as needed if bone ends protrude from injury. Be careful. Prepare splinting materials. 
Apply the splint carefully to the victim, adjust the splint into position, maintain manual stabilization during splinting, secure adjacent joints and the injury site, ensure proper circulation is not compromised. Reassess pulse, motor function and sensation after splinting. Apply cold packs or ice to reduce pain and swelling. Treat for shock, monitor the victim's condition and provide appropriate care. The pre-hospital treatment of specific injuries and application of splints requires that we should always reassess pulse, motor function and sensation before and after splinting. Splinting is carried out in two ways, splinting the upper extremities, splinting the lower extremities, let us know more about them in the coming slides. Splinting the upper extremities includes shoulder and clavicle, humerus or upper arm and shoulder, elbow, forearm and wrist, and hands and fingers. Flip each card to know more. Shoulder and clavicle, signs and symptoms, drooped, deformity or asymmetry, swath, treatment, apply a sling and swath. Use padding if necessary. Humerus or upper arm and shoulder, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling and deformity, treatment, apply a rigid splint to the outside of the arm with pad voids, then use a sling and swath. Elbow, important, splint in the same position as found, do not attempt to straighten, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling and deformity, treatment, Use sling and swath or pillow or blanket if arm is bent at elbow. If elbow is straight, splint entire arm, armpit to finger. Forearm and wrist, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling and deformity, treatment, splint the area with an arm board, then use a sling and swath. Pneumatic splints are also an option. Hands and fingers, important, check pulse with capillary refill, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling and deformity, treatment, tape fractured fingers to another adjacent finger. For multiple finger fractures, splint the entire hand. Pelvis Pelvic injuries can be life-threatening due to massive blood loss, Suspect shock in cases of pelvic injuries, any force strong enough to injure the pelvis can also injure the spine. Signs and symptoms of pelvic injury Pain, especially when pressure is applied to iliac crests or pelvic bones, inability to lift legs while lying on the back. Pre-hospital treatment for pelvic injury Minimize patient movement do not log roll or lift the patient with an unsupported pelvis. Place a folded blanket between the patient's legs from groin to feet and bind together with cravats to upper leg to lower leg. Place the patient on a long backboard. Treat for shock. Hip injuries. It is difficult to differentiate an upper femur fracture from a hip or pelvic fracture or dislocation. Assess for life-threatening injuries as pelvic injuries. Signs and symptoms of hip injury, pain, swelling and discoloration, inability to move legs, possible foot rotation outward or inward. Pre-hospital treatment for hip injuries, bind legs together with a folded blanket between the patient's legs, support the hip with pillows, stabilize the patient on a long backboard or use long splints along the outer thigh, from foot to armpit with padding and along the inner thigh, from groin to foot, secure with cravats. Femoral injuries A femoral fracture can produce massive internal bleeding which may lead to shock. Treat life-threatening condition first. Signs and symptoms of femoral fracture Pain often intense, deformity, rigidity, shortened limb. Pre-hospital treatment for femoral injuries 
If the leg is in a straight position, used to padded splints, one along the inner thigh from groin to the foot, the other along the outer thigh from the armpit to the foot, secure with cravats. Knee injuries, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling, and deformity, bent position, immobilize in the position found, splint the bones above and below with short padded boards. Straight position, used to padded long splints, one on the inner thigh from groin to beyond the foot, and the second on the outer thigh from hip to beyond the foot. Secure with cravats, tibia or fibula injury, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling and deformity, pre-hospital treatment, used to padded long splints, groin to foot and thigh to foot. Secure with cravats. Alternatively, Use a circumferential splint or pneumatic splint for a closed injury, ankle and foot injuries, signs and symptoms, pain, swelling and deformity, pre-hospital treatment, stabilize, remove shoes and socks, if possible, expose the injury. Use a circumferential or formable splint such as a pillow secured with cravats. Alternatively, padded boards to mid-thigh can be used. Now that we have a better understanding of splinting the upper and the lower extremities, let us now learn about the term splinting and reasons for splinting along with types of splints and general rules. Splint is a device that is used for splinting any painful, swollen or deformed body part. The primary objective of splinting is to prevent further movement of body parts. For any splint to be effective, it must immobilize adjacent joints and bone ends. Splinting techniques are used to treat musculoskeletal system abnormalities. The main indications for splinting are to temporarily immobilize a limb for pain and spasm, to decrease swelling, and to minimize further potential soft tissue or neurovascular injuries associated with contusions, sprains, lacerations, fractures dislocations, or painful joints due to inflammatory disorders. Let us now explore the reasons for splinting. Reasons for splinting include to prevent movement of bone fragments or dislocated joints, to reduce pain and suffering, to minimize damage to soft tissues, for example, nerves, arteries, veins and muscles, to prevent a closed fracture from becoming an open fracture, to minimize blood loss or shock. Five basic types of splints, rigid splint, conforming splint, traction splint, sling and swath, improvised splint. Click on each splinting type to know more. Rigid splint requires limb to be in anatomical position. Ideal for long bone injuries, for example cardboard, wood, etc. Traction splint used specifically for femur fractures. Improvised splint a book, cardboard, pillow, blanket, etc. Conforming splint can be molded to different angels or surrounds the extremity, for example air or vacuum splints. Sling and swath, two triangular bandages used to hold an injured arm in place against the body. Regardless of the method of splinting, general rules apply to all types of immobilization as follows. Always communicate your plans with your patient if possible. Before immobilizing an injured extremity, expose and control bleeding. Always cut and remove clothing around the injury site before immobilizing the joint. Remove all jewelry from the site and below it. Assess PMS or pulse, motor function and sensation, 
align the bone with gentle traction or if pain or crepitus worsens discontinue, do not attempt to push protruding bone ends back into place. However, when realigning, they may slip back into place. Make a note if this occurs, pad a splint before applying it. If a joint is injured, immobilize it along with the bones above and below. Volunteers can help in many ways. Volunteers can help responders in ensuring the safety of the victims by clearing hazards present at the incident site. Volunteers can help rescuers in carrying injured victims manually or using a stretcher. They can also help MFRs in dressing and stabilization of injured victims. Volunteers must be aware that certain patient conditions call for special techniques so that injuries do not get aggravated. In such conditions, they should wait for a medic or doctor. Volunteers may help medical staff in the maintenance of a basic life support system. With this, we have come to the end of the module. Let's recollect the key points discussed in the module. Musculoskeletal injuries affect the body's movement system involving joints, muscles, bones and supporting structures. The human musculoskeletal system enables movement through muscles and bones while also serving as a storage system for minerals such as calcium. This system is interconnected by connective tissues such as tendons and ligaments, providing stability to the body. An adult human's skeleton consists of 206 bones formed. From an initial 300 bones at birth that fuse over time, musculoskeletal injuries result from strenuous activities, repetitive motions, or traumatic events. Being common work-related issues, fractures, often caused by accidents or falls, weaken bones and can lead to stress fractures from overuse. Pre-hospital treatment of fractures and dislocations involves examination, stabilization and splinting to immobilize and support injured body parts. Now, it is time to check your understanding of the topic. This is an evaluation exercise. All questions are equally weighted. You need to score at least 60% to pass the test. Read the questions carefully and select the appropriate options. Congratulations!